Thank you very much, uh, moderators and uh, the leaders of the EFF. I've seen the EFF deputy president, the incoming mayor of Johannesburg. I joke. <laughs> and uh, I've seen the provincial chair in the leadership of Houting. Uh, this program took us away from the real program of elections where we're speaking to our people about the importance of bringing about change. But we thought we have an obligation as well to speak to different constituency which you will ordinarily and only get to see here where people pay for chairs to come and listen to politicians speak. So for me, it's a different constituency altogether, and then it's, a, it's an opportunity to really hear from the other side. And I was asking Ranjani if uh, you are going to be given an opportunity to ask questions, because I would want to sit in a meeting where one day you are given opportunity to ask us questions, and we respond to you, because uh, sometimes we do not understand where you come from, because the way I come from, our problems are not the same as you. But I'm happy that uh, you had this event a few days before the commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the June 16. A June 16 where young people engage in a rejection of apartheid and white domination. And they said they don't want to be taught in Africans. And the demand for them not to be taught in Africans was not just a rejection of Africans, but was a rejection of white dominance and a rejection of privilege that comes with being an Africaner. And uh, we have seen the re-emergence of the same demand in the University of Pretoria, in the University of Free State, in many universities where Many young people have said we are tired of Africans being given a privilege over other languages. And it is not something new. Because the teaching of Africans is actually creating an impression amongst white people that they are the special ones and therefore they are not people like all of us. And uh, we think that uh, the continuation of this struggle is very important because it seeks to create equality in our society. We have a responsibility to ensure that we fight for an equal society. But we cannot be an equal society if others are given preference over us. And how are they given preference? Their language is preferred over our languages. And when we say Africans must fall, it doesn't mean Africans must not be spoken. It means Africans should not be given preference and should not be a language of privilege and power. It must be equal to all the languages in South Africa. That's what 1976 demanded. And all of a sudden you want to embrace 1976 and do not want to embrace the demand for the Africans to fall in the institutions of higher learning. That is being a hypocrite because what the students are asking now is the same thing they asked before. The same thing with roads must fall. The same thing with the changing of street names and all that. What is this struggle about? The struggle is to do away with a, a, a white privilege and white dominance in our society. We will never do away with white privilege and dominance if we do not confront it. And if we do not conscientize society that naming places after people who presided over black genocide and promoted apartheid will actually make white people think they are more superior than us. And we don't want that. So I came here not to please anyone. I'm here to speak the truth. Whether you like it or not, it's your own baby to feed Malta Bella. I'm not in the business of going around to please people. I only tell the truth. Now, I, am, I, I represent a non-racial organization, but we do not fight for white people. Why? Why should we fight for them? What do, you want? what do they want? When you say you are fighting for all in South Africa, black and white, what do white people want? Except to want to remain in a position of privilege. That's what they want. 
They want to remain in a position of privilege and we are rejecting that. There is no white person who's going to remain in a position of privilege. We must all be equal. And in bringing the equality, we have to take deliberate decisions to empower the less privileged to be at the same level with those who are privileged. And that's what the EFF manifesto speaks about. Why should we build bicycle lanes? For what? White people demand bicycle lanes even when there is no cycling culture in South Africa because they just want something to be done in their areas. Why? Because we are the ones who are paying the high taxes and rates. So something must be done here. You just want things to happen in your areas because you are paying. But there is a huge constituency of people without water and electricity. You must be ashamed that you want bicycle lanes. There are people without flushing toilets. That's what you are, that's what you are so... principal came here to tell you before me. And, and he speak everything nice. We are here to crush white dominance. We are here to create an equal society. And crushing of white dominance does not mean hatred of white people. It means the deliberate effort to liberate the black African majority which is oppressed and that is not division. Division is when you protect white privilege to the exclusion of black majority. And no one, not Musi, not Zueli, represent that agenda. None of them is committed to stand before you and tell you that we want to bring to black people to the same level with you. We are in a show to watch a music festival. And we are sitting at the back there. I'm with a fellow who is short. And this fellow can't see the artist who's performing there. And then when they bring a chair for this fellow to be at the same level with me to see the artist who's performing there, I have, now I complain. No, we are being treated differently. Why is this one having a chair and I do not have a chair? We are equal. Hey, we are not equal. He can see, you can see. You have to see all of you. There is nothing for free for everybody. Musi must learn to read and stop pretending to be a reader. He must read the EFF manifesto if he cares to do so. There is nothing free for everybody. There is free for the poor. Yes. I earn my salary. is almost more than a million. They wrote about it in the papers yesterday. My grandmother has got no income at all. But she buys, if a liter of water is one rand, she's going to pay one rand and I'm going to pay one rand for the liter of water. What type of equality is that? When she's got no income at all, here is a parliamentarian who pays one rand, the same amount of money with the person who has got no income. And when I say for those who do not have income, there must be a special price for them. No, he wants free everything for everybody. It is unfair. It is actually undermining the agenda to fight for equality. We need to empower the poor masses of our people. And the rich and the privileged ones should be at the forefront of subsidizing the poor working with government. What is the agenda here? You want water, they want water. You can afford to pay for water, they cannot afford to pay water. And we are saying, let them get water for free. Why should you complain? Because you are also getting water. The only difference is that you can afford for it. Let us give our people water. Our people live in houses in the urban areas with taps which can't produce water because the municipalities have closed. There is no difference between pick and pay and the municipality. When you go to pick and pay, you pay to get water. When you go to a municipality, you pay to get water. Municipalities must not be run like business entities. They must know their first mandate is to deliver services to our people. 
They must not think their first mandate is to collect money from the people. Give the people water and make those who can afford to pay, pay. And then create methods to raise money. Politicians must start thinking and stop sitting on their brains. How do we generate money without exploiting the poor? How do we create money? We need to have municipalities which are engaged in creativity so that they raise money to subsidize the poor. The poor are actually more poorer today. Why do we have a situation where people don't have flushing toilets? These houses that Zulim Kize is talking about, they've given people RDP houses. After 1994, you give people RDP houses without a flushing toilet. And then you want to say you are bringing dignity of people back without a flushing toilet. There's no dignity without a flushing toilet. You can't claim to have dignity without a flushing toilet. There is no dignity which has been restored through giving people houses which are not in good condition first, but secondly, those houses do not have flushing toilets. If you go even in the most rural areas, you find a farm. In that farm, there is a, a farmhouse of a white man. That white man is not helping himself in a pit toilet. He's got a flushing toilet. Next to that farm, there is a village. That village, the whole village, they use pit toilets. Why is the ANC not going into the white man's farm to see how the white man is flushing and take the same method of the white man and give to black communities next to that farm? I'm just saying because they are lazy thinkers. Maybe if they go to a white man's farm, they will see it practically and start doing it. They can't think of how do we give our people flushing toilets. I had a farm myself which was taken away from me by the ANC and given to a white man again. Now, next to that farm, there was a village without flushing toilets, but that farm had a flushing toilet. There was electricity, that's the most painful thing. Electricity in all these farms. And as you follow the poles, which are providing electricity in the white farms, they pass the village without electricity. Where is the explanation for that? You give the farmers electricity, you don't give our people electricity. Yet the poles are passing there. And, and I support this thing of illegal connection of electricity because those people... Those people are actually demonstrating to government practically that you are fools. This thing is doable. We've just done it ourselves. We've just done it ourselves. So that thing exposes the government of the ANC that it is not true that it is practically impossible to deliver electricity to us. We are doing it. And therefore, government must feel ashamed and move in to give our people save electricity after being exposed by our people. Mr. They come here and talk about the land and they ask Musi, what is your land policy? He waffles here and you clap hands for him <laughs> because he has not said anything on land. He says, I support land restitution and redistribution, but the moderators don't ask him a simple question. Since you support land restitution and redistribution, who have you given land in Western Cape? Who? Who have you given land, Helen Zile? Who have you given land, Musi? Where we govern, you even change accent. Where? Where? Where have you given people land? There is no democracy without land. At the core of our struggle, what started the ANC was as a result of land dispossession. The, the wars which were fought by African people against the British and colonizers, and they got defeated. They then realized that fighting as small tribes is self-defeating. We need to come together so that we fight for our land. So the starting of liberation 
struggle in South Africa was not necessarily about the issue of who becomes a president. The issue has always been the land. Mandela went to prison for land. Subukwe was killed for land. Steve Biko was killed for land. Chris Hani was killed for land. They were not killed because they wanted to become politicians in air-conditioned offices. The land question is non-negotiable. Thank you. Let's go. Okay. See you see. <laughs> um, there's no question. This is a terribly unequal society. Um, but every time I come to a press conference, I've seen you dozens, maybe hundreds of times, there's a certain point in the press conference where the media gets yelled at. We get yelled at for being nasty to the EFF. I actually disagree with that. I think the media has been very kind to the EFF. We're getting to a point now where little birds are telling us that the EFF is hitting about 12% of the popular vote in this country. This is no longer a social experiment. This, this is very, very real. Mm -hmm. You guys are a political entity that is here to stay in this country. And I don't think we've, as, 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 as media, as a block, I don't think we've interrogated the actual policies enough at this stage. So what I'd like to start with is sort of the nuts and bolts of your election manifesto, your local election manifesto, because that's why we're here today. Um, the, the thing about it is that it makes a couple of real, real demands. And the first and most important demand it makes is on the councillors. Basically, an EFF municipality would be almost like a cradle-to-grave conception that would, that would encompass almost every level of society. You're saying that if you're offering free food markets, you're offering abattoirs, you're offering creches, you're offering a complete social program that starts at A and ends at Z. Right? And the councillors are at the core, core of this. Where on earth, and I don't mean South Africa, I mean on earth, are we going to find these CEO geniuses who are going to run these Fortune 500 entities that are EFF municipalities? We have a, a lot of people in South Africa with the necessary skill who can run very successful uh, institutions of the municipality. The problem is that they are being denied that opportunity because they are not members of ruling political parties, the DA or the ANC. So we ought to say we are building abattoirs for our people and uh, we need the best skill to come and run these abattoirs. And we need to then start looking for that uh, a good skill, not EFF and not ANC or anyone, South African with the necessary skill. And if we do not have, after searching from amongst South African, black and white, then we can go outside to go and look for the best, to come help us establish this good idea which with an intention to transfer skill to South Africans. But are you training your councillors to do what your manifesto promises that they will do? Our councillors are being trained. Part of what we're doing now as part of election uh, campaign is to meet councillor candidates, uh, workshop them on the manifesto, workshop them on the type of conduct we expect from an EFF councillor and that uh, it is actually non-negotiable. We are not like the ANC and just talk about firing of people. There are certain things that if you do, like relocating where you stay as a council after being elected, you are automatically out. If you are, if you are found to have asked uh, for sex in exchange for providing services to our people, you are out. If you are found to have taken a bribe from whoever with legitimate uh, you know, evidence, you are out. So we want to establish the EFF with such discipline from amongst our, our members. I've seen the article that says the ANC has got so many councillors with criminal records. We are waiting for the EFF one. We are not going to say like whether the IEC must deal with that. Anyone found to have a criminal record, there is no IEC which is going to deal with that. You are automatically disqualified because we have made it very clear to all the cadres of the EFF, no one with, with a criminal record should accept nomination of being a counsel. So once IEC says there is a problem with this one, there is a criminal record, out. We move forward. Okay, we are not the a home of criminals. 
there, there's, there's discipline, there's politics, and then there's deranged social engineering. I mean, you trying to say, I mean, from peop, you, you, uh, people not being allowed to pee in the streets, not that I want that, yeah. but I'd say, and to how they have sex. Mm. Your manifest, manifesto has prescriptions on, on what is happening. You, you even encouraging people to have babies. Yeah. Um, and, uh, is that revolutionary? In two bedroom talk? houses. Yes. Mm. So uh, this is not ordinary politics. Mm. Houses have never limited us from having kids. I, know. I, 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 yeah. I, I, I yeah. grew up in a four-roomed mm. house. My grandmother had nine kids. Yeah. And we all stayed in that house. I and I came to golf. be what I am now. Mm. So don't think houses determine how many kids you must have. It's not yeah. a house. I know. It's the energy that <laughs> determines how many kids you want to have. So. Uh, 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 so he, 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 he uh, what was your question? I, I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that this is not an ordinary manifesto. Yes. You are prescribing yes. from... Absolutely. We are dictating, you know, uh, we have a situation where uh, people drink alcohol uh, in townships, in weddings, uh, in functions, and in between the wedding and home, a person wants to help himself and just stand on the middle of the road and then pee to a point where kids even start playing with that person. That's not a respected <laughs> member of society. So we're demonstrating that we need someone who's respected by the community. Not a loose somebody who happened to buy people alcohol and then they vote him as a candidate of the EFF. That's why after electing a candidate, the EFF then goes back to the community to say, here is our person, and they are allowed to, to object. Uh, so we, we have to start it from the beginning so that if they make a mistake, they shouldn't say we didn't know. They all know what type of a counselor we want. Now, understood we don't want corrupt counselors, and yeah. it would be great if we didn't have counselors who weren't criminals, but I want to go back to this notion of how difficult... I mean, I've, I've, I've read through all of your documentations on, yeah. on, on, your, on your municipal, uh, your people's municipalities. I want to get back to how difficult it would be to run one of these things. I know for a fact I do not have the so-called capacity to run an e a people's municipality, so I'm out of the running, unfortunately. Where are you going to find these people? And, I, and, and once again, I, I, it's not a South Africa thing. Yeah. I mean, where in the world are you going to find thousands of CEOs? You know... Uh it, it's not true that these people are not there. I've answered that question. They, they, under apartheid, they were state-owned entities which were run very well and made white suburbs to be what they are now. And, and we can learn a thing or two from that. We need South Africans who are patriotic, who love their country, who will do everything to make sure that this country succeeds. They are here a lot of them. They are not being given opportunities. I, I'm saying that in South Africa, the problem is not about the implementation of what we want to do. The problem is lack of political will, patronage, and cadership development are the ones that have undermined our municipalities. These people go and fetch a geography teacher to come and run technical department of the municipality. When there is a sewer blockage, a person puts their hands on top of the head. Yo, what do we do? <laughs> they don't even know how to go about it. Where are the retired Africaners? They are here. Who ran best Africaner municipalities? They've now come to accept that they supported an evil system. They want to Proud back. If we can't find the necessary skill, let's go and fetch the old man. Old man, you are coming to mentor this young one to produce the best product we seek and build South Africa. Okay, but you, you're basically saying that there should be some type of social cohesion uh, so that you use skills that are in society um, to be able to deal with current problems. So you, you're talking about this old man now, but just now, you were talking about crushing white dominance. Yes. So what is the line between the two? So you think uh, uh, old men 
asking an old man to come and plow back to his community. It's a perpetuation of white dominance. We don't want that. It's not a perpetuation of white dominance together. There is nothing wrong with crushing white supremacy. It is wrong to think that you are superior uh, to others on the basis of the color of your skin. And what perpetuates that is the economic exclusion of our people. I'm saying to you, not old white men come and run the municipality. Old white men come, here is a young man, work with him to build capacity. Let the skill be transferred. So in as much as we're defeating white supremacy, and I said in the same platform, the defeating of white supremacy and dominance is not hatred of white people. When I say I hate white supremacy, I don't say I hate white people. But this is their home. They've got a role to play. But they must agree that there must be a deliberate program to empower black people the same way there was a deliberate program to empower them. But do your, all your supporters understand the distinction? When, when you say crush white dominance, can that not be interpreted in another way that inflames the current environment? You, you think they are gullible. You think they are fools. You think they are empty heads. That's how you view black people. No. It's wrong. That's what I'm asking it's you wrong. the question. No, uh, it's wrong because uh, that's what we are subjected to. Uh, when you say you will take a gun uh, in defense of your revolution, uh, uh, some fool stands here and say you are spreading violence. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a words of cowards like him. Uh, Zuma is not going to beat me up and I just fold my arms. It's not going to happen that. I'm going to fight back. I'm not going to start any violence. EFF is not a violent organization. There is no single EFF member who has been killed by another EFF member fighting for positions. There is no anyone in this country who has been shot by EFF member. There is no any violence that can be attributed to the EFF. Dr. Mkise standing here comes from a most violent organization which shoot people, which kill each other for positions. We don't have that. All we are saying is that we have no cheek to offer anymore. There's nothing to offer. We're going to fight. You, Zuma lost elections in Alexander. And then they stole elections. They lost elections in Gauteng. And then they stole the elections. When the people were protesting in Alexander, they sent the soldiers in Alex. I had to drive from Polokwane to Pretoria to accept the results so that we calm the situation in Alexander. It's not going to happen again. They steal the elections. We'll meet them. Uh, on the streets. We're not scared. Meet We're not promoting. Meet them on the streets and, but do, and do, what? do what? We will fight. If they are fighting, we'll fight. With what? With what, everything we have. You're fighting the army? With We're what? fighting the state violence. The state violence will be met with violence. That's what the ANC did. The ANC was the most peaceful organization until the 60s when they could no longer tolerate violence which was meted at them by the apartheid regime. They applied the same strategy, we will apply the same strategy they used but against apartheid. Are you not putting your supporters' lives at risk by saying that? No, no, I'm putting my life at risk. There's no supporter who will go, I will go myself. I've always led from the front. There's no way where EFF supporters have been and I've not been there. I believe in this, I will do it myself. But I was at an event in Alexandra where a, a, an EFF supporter was shot by someone out of the Medalla Hostel um, in the leg. There were no EFF uh, leadership there at the time. So my, my question is, it's true, it's true. My question is, this can get real. How are we going to protect people? Firstly, it's not Alexander, it's Tembisa. Let's get the facts right. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Where no, Alexander. The, 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 where the, which incident are you referring to? Out of the Medalla Hostel, an EFF supporter was shot. This was a year and a half ago. No, man, I was there. I, the event. You were there after. Yeah, I, no, 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 no. I will not know what time are they going to shoot. <laughs> let's, let's clarify you. Uh, because I don't plan the shooting with them. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> now, uh, uh, I would the like EFF to plan member who was shot in Alexander, it is because they were waiting for me. 
And even when a member was shot, I didn't make a U-turn. I went into the same streets where a member was shot. I addressed, after addressing, I went door to door in the same areas where the member was shot. So it's unfortunate the member was shot before I arrived. But I was, I, I went there, I did not make a U-turn, and to put such a question to suggest that we are not there is actually disingenuous because the event you are referring to, I was there, and I led from the front. So I don't hesitate to lead from the front. There is no Zuma and the ANC talk about barrels of guns and all those things. But you because use the they term, want to, not them. No, no, yes. I, I, I said that. Yes, I said, and I will repeat it anyway. If you use violence against us, we are prepared to take up arms in defense of our revolution. Where would that, you get the arms from? The arms are everywhere. <laughs> arms can be found anywhere. If, if there is a political here win, today. we will yeah. find. No, even here, there is arms here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you may not yeah. be aware. Let someone react in a very bad way. It's going to be taught a lesson. Okay. Very quick. Yeah, I'll so behave don't myself. Be, don't be misled. All we are saying is that let's fight a peaceful fight. And we are doing that. We went to Mpumalanga to vote, to campaign. Our members were shot. We went to KZN to campaign. Our members were shot. And I said to the members, don't respond. Because this is a provocation. The enemy is shaking. The enemy is actually accepting unwittingly that this is an unstoppable train of economic freedom. So we must not take up arms to self-destruct. We must not self-destruct because the enemy is going to set us up to self-destruct. So this thing is coming out very nicely. It's jailing nicely. And, uh, and we're going to take over this government. You won't believe it. And there will not be a single drop of blood. There will never be. Not under my instruction. Not under my, but if we are fought, there will, there will be levels where our members will say to the leadership, we have tolerated this for, for far too long now. Okay, so a lot of your campaign, or in fact, the, the EFF's program from 2014, is that you are maximizing on the levels of anger and discontent in society. Whereas the DA does the same thing. It highlights the ANC's problems, the ANC's weaknesses, the ANC's failings they don't draw as much support from discontented communities as you do, which leads me to believe that a lot of your support is built on that anger and discontent. So once you are, for example, if you do win um, a, a number of seats in councils, you can't continue to, to run a municipality based on anger and con uh, discontent. What is then, uh, then happens? I just want you to show me anger and discontent in the manifesto of the EFF. Because we are not running this on anger and discontent. We are running this on an alternative left perspective. Because there is a vacuum in terms of left politics. And we identified that vacuum. Because nature does not allow a vacuum. We occupied that space. We came in because the Communist Party is a spasa shop. It's dead. We came in because there is no alternative on the left. And that's how we zoom in. So we don't exist on the basis of anger and discontent. And that's why when we run SRCs in the University of Limpopo and everywhere else, we deliver to every commitment, there is no anger and discontent. We said to the University of Limpopo, we are going to give every student free meal, especially the poor of the poorest. And then there was noise. Where are you going to get the money? This is rhetoric. And then we went into the SRC. We took the money of Freshers Ball and entertainment and alcohol, redirected it to giving poor students free meal every day. We are doing it every day. So where is anger and discontent? There is no anger and discontent. It's a left politics that takes care of the poor masses of our people. I'm glad we sort of touched on money because yeah. one of the big questions, I guess, out of the manifesto was how are these munici municipalities, which again are, are cradle to grave institutions, how are they going to afford to pay for all of these different services? Um, we understand that the conditional grant system in this country is, is a nightmare, mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're sort of hamstrung 
at least until 2019, by the laws of the land. Um, you mentioned that you will look for money from international aid organizations. You mentioned that you will look for money from the private sector. To my reading, your, man your manifesto actually squeezes the private sector out of your m municipalities. So my question is, who's going to pay for all this cool stuff? Look, I've always complained that the private sector is not playing a significant role. And when we squeeze it is to say to them, you too have a responsibility to contribute to the development of this country and not to just come and milk this country and leave it dry. So we're not pushing anyone out. We're saying to them, you ought to play a more a constructive and developmental role in this country. That's point number one. Point number two, I don't understand why a municipality gets a land. They've got a land of their own. They sell that land to pick and pay to come and build a mall, right? And then that, that's once off transaction, they are out. In an EFF-owned municipality, there's no pick and pay which is going to buy land from us. We're going to say to pick and pay, what a wonderful proposal of a mall. We're going to take 40% because we're coming with the land and you will take 60%. Let's work together. And then we benefit from that transaction permanently and not once off. That's what we need to do. So when I say politicians must stop sitting on their minds, they ought to start thinking, how do we generate income without squeezing the poor so that we finance our social program, which is empowering the poor masses of our people. There are a lot of opportunities that municipalities can create. They are just lazy uh, to think. One of those, I gave you example of the land. The second thing, I come from Sishiu in the township outside Pulugwan. All what in Pulugwan, they've got a park, park, that entertainment place there. They call it a park, you know, it's the things of white people. I don't know if we really need those things. Park. And then, and then we do a park, and then we hire people to go and look after that park, right? And no one goes to that park from our communities. Our kids still play on the street. They don't play at the park. Why? It tells you that you developed something which is not in line with the priorities of this community. So we don't want a park. That money of the park, please build a clinic which will operate 24 hours. And then take that money you are paying those workers who are cleaning the park, which is not being used, to pay the workers of this clinic, which is going to work 24 hours. You are asking me, where are you going to get the money? Here is the money. It, the priorities are messed up. We are going to reprioritize and prioritize the needs of our people. Where are you going to get the money for Alexander? Hey, Santin, no more bicycle lanes. We are taking the bicycle lanes. We are going to now give the people of Alexander the water. The money is there. Why would white people fight? I want the white people of Santin to fight and say this government is taking from us. That anger is going to draw them into meetings. And then I will go and address them. And I will conscientize these white people of South Africa that we all have a responsibility to empower each other. We need you to contribute. They will never get that, they will never get that message because they don't come to the meetings. Why are they not coming to meetings? They don't need anything. Once I stop bicycle lanes, they will come. I'm going to grab them there and politicize them. Okay. Let, let, let's talk about the economy because it's a, the economy is a big issue in our country at the moment. What can you do as the leader of the economic freedom fighters to lend to economic and political stability in our country? What do you think we need to do that we're not doing? We need the uh, political leadership with political will. The leadership must have integrity. The leadership must be selfless. And uh, once you've got respectable leadership, that's the first step in the right direction. Then you ought to now make sure that the right resources are invested in the sectors that make this economy to be what it is. We have not maximized uh, ourselves with regard to the minerals of this country. Uh, we know that uh, commodity prices may have problems from time to time. It's not only in South Africa, it happens globally. But when it is a good turn 
and commodity prices are paying very well, we still don't get to benefit anything because we are not involved as a state from ownership and control perspective. So we want the state which will be involved in the uh, minerals. We want the state that will not only uh, own, but will also control so that you know how many diamonds are produced and how much is due to us. We're not closing completely out the private sector. We are actually calling in a nice English way for partnership. But I'm not an Englishman, I'm a politician. So that's why I talk nationalization. So nationalization actually means greater state control and ownership. But it doesn't mean a complete ban of private participation. So we need government to be involved. The, the British must stop telling us that, no, uh, capital will leave South Africa if the state uh, gets involved in business. It's not true. After the world wars, the state took ownership of the economy of Britain, rebuilt it to be what it is today. When there was a crisis in the U.S., the state came in, rescued those banks, which is a clear indication these people can't rescue themselves. The state will always have to be there for them. And we are saying to them, we want to now walk with you so that you don't drown. There is no best partner you can get than a state as your partner. Stop being crybabies. Accept that the state is here to work with you to rebuild this economy. And the state, through the profits made out of such huge transactions, will reinvest that money in the social program to make South Africa a, a better place. Venezuela, I heard this one, this priest talking about Venezuela. <laughs> Firstly, he doesn't know Venezuela. Secondly, he has never been to Venezuela. Secondly, he Googled before he came here about Venezuela and got wrong information. 80% of the Venezuelan economy is from the oil. And oil price makes it very difficult now for countries that depend on oil to perform very well. It's not only the issue of socialism. Just generally, the oil thing is not working. It's like the problems that we had uh, during the nationalization of steel, uh, and, 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 and no, not steel, copper. Uh, they nationalized it at a point where copper was not doing well as a commodity. And that, those mines failed. And when those mines were not doing well, they attributed that to nationalization. It's not correct. State-owned uh, institutions, they are not inherently incompetent. One of them is AXA in South Africa. We build the best airports. And yet, that is a state-owned company. To build an airport is not like building uh, some useless uh, things. It's a complicated thing. Yet, the state company is doing it very well. Dinell used to do very well before this one, Makanda Kanda, the headman, <laughs> came in and destroyed it uh, with the Guptas. Transnet used to do very well before Zuma Kronis destroyed it. It's not about the state inherently being incompetent. It's corruption that undermines the good efforts of the state because they deploy their cronies, they deploy their cadres who know nothing about Transnet. I mean, you just take, take Julius Malema now to go and run Transnet because he can sing very well in political <laughs> meetings. That's a recipe for disaster. So let's go for a man and a woman who's got the necessary capacity uh, to run those institutions. Look at what Zuma's girlfriend is doing to SAA. <laughs> now, it has moved, it has moved from Kedas, it has moved from cronies to congubites. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has degenerated to the extreme. It has, somebody has to say it. It has degenerated to the extreme. It's not like SAA can't make profit. It did that before under a female CEO, black female CEO. So the problem is not state-run institutions, it's corruption. The leadership has to be firm on corruption. The ANC can't punish Zuma on corruption because they are all corrupt. It's a gangster. We are run by a gangster. 
and you disagree with them, they will kill you. If they don't kill you, they will expel you. They will send the institutions of the state against you. They will destroy you. Not because they want to destroy you. No, they are intimidating anyone else who wants to dare challenge them after you. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. I just want to ask you before we wrap up. You mentioned the Gupta family. Yeah. You have clearly placed them in your sights as a target. You said you will drive them out of the country. They have gone, but they are, still seem to have an influence. What are you going to do next? Well, we are on the Gupta's case. We're not playing. Um, <laughs> you know, when we spoke about the Guptas, we were attacked from all angles that we are wrong, we are driving away the investors, we are doing all sorts of things, we are anarchists and all that. Uh, and then everybody else came, the banks, said, no, there is a problem here. Uh, we are closing the accounts. And then everyone else said, yeah, this Guptas are a problem. Why? Because it is now said by a white man that these people are a problem because the white man owns the banks. So they are a problem. And the problem of the Guptas is actually promoted by Zuma. Because I, I used to think the Guptas are giving him small money until I was made aware that they're giving him millions of money, cash. Zuma said he was going to sue me because I said uh, he took money to Dubai and uh, he must do that. He must sue me. Because Zuma is benefiting directly from the Guptas. The ANC stopped the Gupta investigation because Zuma said so. Zuma said to Houting PGC, do you know what is the state? The state is the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. When you say there is a capture, have they captured judicial? Hmm? Have they? <laughs> and, then, and then no one dares to challenge him that they've captured you and you are the head of the state and once they've captured the head of the state, they've captured the state. So, and, and, and he speak like he's got a point, but I worked with him, so I know. He's extremely limited, you know, intellectual. So, so I know how he does things when he has run out of reason. He say, hmm, and I'm like, ah. Uh, how, how I wish I was there. Because I would have said, stop it there. Stop it right there. Let me explain to you where the concept of state capture comes from. We will finish the Guptas when we finish Jacob Zuma. For as long as Zuma is a president, corruption will never stop. For as long as Zuma is the president, the Guptas will continue to capture the state. But I can tell you here now, Zuma is extremely powerful, at least in the ANC. Zuma, if he wants to be the president of the ANC, he will be president of the ANC for the third time. And no one will stop him. Because they, they are all scared of him. He has built this power. Let me tell you, Ranjani will know that when you go before the ANC conference, a year before, there are new songs songs i want to give a simple example the new songs about the incoming president that's preparation of succession there is no single song today about the possible president because that debate is suppressed zuma suppressed the gupta debate zuma suppressed the succession debate he's still weighing his option why is zuma so in love with the presidency it's not because he's got something to offer to South Africa. He's scared to go to prison. And he knows the only way of not going to prison is when you are in charge of presidency and then you can control the NPA. That Sean is nothing there. I've got no respect for such people. He's got Sean, he's got that man at SARS, uh, Tom. He's got all the state institutions. So Zuma is so in charge that like he's only coming in now. He's not like a man who's going out. He has taken charge of all the strategic institutions of the state, including parliament. So he's not going anywhere. So the fight against Zuma 
It's not a fight against the man. It's a fight against corruption, which is institutionalized by Zuma. If you're not corrupt, you're not promoted by Zuma. That's why Ramaphosa became the deputy president. How can a normal organization, a normal organization with morals, promote a man who has just killed people in Marikana? Same year. They say to him, well done, become deputy president. And you still want to tell me there is some morality left for this organization, which promote a man who's at the center of the killing of the people in Marika. So the ANC is finished. The DA is not an option because the DA protects white privilege. It wants to perpetuate white privilege. My money is not a DA leader. A DA leader is Helen Zille. You must see every time the EFF makes inroads and it succeeds on something, it won't be my man who's tweeting against the EFF to counter it. It's Helen Zille who feels the pains more than my man because she is the real leader. When the DA leader resigned in Eastern Cape, it is not my man who went to negotiate with, the DA, with her. It was Helen Zille. When we were removed in the state of the nation, the first one when the EFF moved into parliament, my money said to Baleka, tell me if these people are police. If you don't tell me these people are police or they are not, we are leaving. Then Baleka said, you can leave. My money took his things and stood up. The DA caucus remained seated. And then Steinhazen stood up. The white chief whip said the same thing that my money said. And said, if you don't guarantee me, I'm leaving. They said, if you leave, it will be on your own. We're not going to chase you out. He took his things. He stood up. The white caucus and the whole caucus stood up and left. If you doubt what I'm saying because you don't like the truth, go and Google it on YouTube and look at this part. You will see it. Mr. Malema, we're unfortunately out of time. We are the only party for black people, man. There's no any other party which can liberate black people in this country. It's only the EFF and uh, we have our policies at least we know what we stand for unlike people who are asked what is your position on land what is your land policy we support land reinstitution uh -uh, policy not what you support the eff land policies expropriation without compensation yes. Mr. Malema, i don't want to call, call you to order like yes. madam speaker yeah. so i have to stop you speaking one, now, yeah last question as we one last up, question please. very quickly You've said some unkind things about the ANC. You've said some unkind things about the DA. Come August 4th, do you get into bed with them to govern wards or to govern cities? Coalitions. We want coalition of the opposition, not coalition with the DA. We will not go into coalition with the ANC because we'll be undermining our people. Remember that any municipality where the ANC gets less than 50%, the people will be whispering, saying to us, we don't want the ANC. So to go into coalition with the ANC, you are undermining those people. We don't want a coalition with the DA. We want a coalition of the opposition parties. In Johannesburg, they must come together and say, guys, mayoral candidate for EFF, I give example, is Floyd Shibambo. And then mayoral candidate for DA, I forgot the man from Black Like Me, uh, Herman Mashaba. Uh, who? Herman Mashaba. Herman Mashaba is not a politician. That's why I forget him. <laughs> now, and then from the UDM is this one, from this one is this one. Let the opposition leaders come and say, these are the mayoral candidates. Who is the best amongst them? Surely Herman Mashaba is not better than Floyd Shibambo. Academically, intellectually, politically, beautifully, <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> So let's, let the parties choose the best cadre. And even if that cadre comes from the UDM and the UDM got the lowest votes, let it be. Remember the policy is let the best man or woman do the job and not the political parties. On that note, thank you very, very thank much, you. Mr. Thank Malema. You. And uh, we hope that we still have the opportunity to find out about this fitness regime. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.